Hi, my name is Cheryl Kelly, and we are still uh, going over the Oneness Doctrine, and we are uh, doing a second part to a video that I did yesterday on the Seed of Faith. I believe we need to go into uh, further details explaining that Yeshua, because he, him being a son of God, he was the begotten son of God, made this pathway to bring in many sons. And I was uh, looking at the video today and I noticed that I kind of botched up where it says in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 that for it became became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons so we see scripturally that this is the was the mission of yeshua this was the mission of messiah was to bring in many sons uh, so one son would bring in many sons uh, unto the glory and make and he would be the captain of our salvation making us perfect through his suffering and so we uh so this concept of the son of god that had originated from the beginning was always the plan of god to bring in many sons because we now have become a bastard in in the sense of we fell out of this position humanity fell out of the position of becoming a son of god because adam was the first created son of god so everyone after him became a rebel everyone after him became a bastard because he he rebelled against the commandment of god he disobeyed and that changed his status from being a son to a bastard so bastard doesn't always mean uh, being illegitimate. In God's mindset, that's not exactly, uh, uh, you know, being, uh, because everything that has to do with spiritual things are not necessarily, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, similarities of, of having natural things that explain the spiritual but a bastard is is mainly someone that is not been uh, that has not been re that has not been proven by God or been uh, uh, he, he, they have not been reproved. Does that make sense? And so it doesn't mean that they were illegitimate. Ba bastard means hybrid in in the scriptures. Someone that has a duality. Someone that is mixed a mixed breed someone that is uh, uh that is is a mongrel so because we uh, inherit this serpent seed the this uh contamination this in our bloodline we and now we have a duality within our soul we are double-minded because we ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and so now we we have this duality inside of us now we have to get this weeded out of our system, out of our soul, so that because what the Bible says, a double-minded man cannot receive anything from God, and that doesn't mean someone who keeps changing their mind. That means that you can't switch to being spiritual to carnal to carnal to spiritual. You have to either be a spiritually minded or carnally minded, and we go through the path and on this journey. That we're mainly carnal, and then we'll maybe be spiritual. We'll have an, an epiphany, or we'll have a, a a moment in time where we we uh, we you know experience God, or we'll walk out our spirituality. But then the cares of this life will choke that, and we'll suppress that, and we will get so busy in life that we will. Uh, slip back into the carnal realm back into carnality we we won't walk out our faith we won't persevere we'll we'll become very lazy in our walk and so and where it's easy in our nature to walk carnally naturally physically uh you know fulfilling the needs of our our bodies because our bodies speak to us loudly when we're in pain we feel it when we're hungry we feel it when we're depressed we feel it 
the feelings that we have are legitimate and they're real and they're relevant to us at the moment that we're experiencing it. If we're feeling depressed, depression or oppression or if we're feeling, uh, you know, lonely, these things seem to overcome us. When we are, but we're to be walking in belief. We are to be walking in faith and we're supposed to be sanctifying our feelings and we're supposed to be being complete in him and our wholeness is found in Yeshua. The but you know you know he is our Sabbath rest, and I keep saying because he he offers us and administrates the kingdom of peace. But the kingdom of peace means to be whole. You know you know he he asks the people, are you going? You know, are, is this the day that we're you know that you are going to be? Are you are will you be made that whole? You know, there's this passage in scripture. He asked the question, will you be made whole? Because it's in that belief of, of knowing that we can come into this completeness, this, this ability of being made complete and whole in him, spirit, soul, and body. Mm -hmm. So, but we are on a journey. So we're trying to get away from this double mindness mm -hmm. to a single mind, a spiritual mind, that is connected to the Holy Spirit so that when these feelings come, when our body is screaming to us and our emotions are screaming out to us, that we're not listening to what our body is telling us in the sense of, of giving in to that oppression, giving in to that depression, giving in to those anxieties, giving in to those fears, but we will overcome them with the Word of God. We will overcome them with the power of believing and trusting and putting the word of God in effect and speaking those things into uh, the word of God into our life until those feelings change to the, the, the situation uh, make, you know, and the, uh, the circumstance changes in your life because their the feelings are fleeting. They'll come one day and they'll be gone tomorrow. They're, they they don't stay with us. Now, there's times where people go through long durations of depression and oppression, and sometimes they need uh, to be, they need to go, you know, for prayer. They need people to pray over them. They need to call for the elders of the church or call the elders of uh, people, and so that, that they could be prayed for because a lot of times, a lot of things that we're feeling, the things that we're experiencing, have to do with a, de a demonic force that is attacking our mind, our soul, our emotion, and our bodies. And so, but God gave, Yeshua gave us the power through his blood that we can start expelling these things, changing our condition, changing our thoughts, changing the way we feel, and we, be, and we can become whole in him. So a bastard doesn't mean someone that has been born out of wedlock, which a lot of in us, we think of that as being uh, an illegitimate child that doesn't have a father. Well, we kind of don't have a father because our, because he, our, uh, Adam took that, took that out of, you know, it was no fault of our own, but he kind of took us away from our heavenly father and now we were put under a deadbeat dad, basically a, a, a worthless dad, a worthless, uh, you know, entity that has no father attributes or characteristics. So we're all bastard, rejected, downtrodden people that are looking and, uh, and searching for their way back to the father to be complete and can and be made whole. Does that make sense? So, and I did write in my book, The Last Kingdom Will Even Elect to Receive, on, on this subject. So, before I read in my book, I wanted to read in uh, Isaiah 9, and starting with the sixth verse. For unto us a child is born, unto a son, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. 
upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it, it with it with judgment and with justice for hence for henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Lord sent a word into Jacob and he had lightened it upon Israel. So Yeshua is the progenerator of a, another race or, and we are born again into this kingdom of sons. So we can see he is the everlasting father because he came from, you know, he came from everlasting and now since the Tanakh or the Old Testament is more centered around God the Father and how the Father married Israel and how the Father gave Israel a certificate of divorcement and, and we know the laws that, you can, you know, if you've been uh, divorced, remarried, you can't go back to the first husband. So there's laws that can't that God himself cannot violate. So he established this kingdom. He established it with Israel with uh with jacob because he'd be in the fourth prince you know this fourth prince signifies because the four is dalit and door so this is the doorway to both kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth we're, we're going to parallel each other because jacob uh descendants would expand from north south east and west so this shows that he, it would just not be just in a small place in the Middle East, but his his kingdom would be an uh, eternal kingdom through David, and it would expand. The borders would expand beyond just natural Israel. Mm -hmm. So, and and so we see these similarities in the Bible, and it clarifies that Yeshua is the one, the Son the only begotten son that would sit on David's throne forever. And that throne was established here in the natural and it was transferred into the eternal. And it says he would rule with judgment and justice, which we see in Revelation, he rules with a rod of iron. So he rules, uh, he, you know, he is a, a, king, a, a king warrior. And he is going to come back and he's going to bring justice and judgment on the earth. And he's going to uh, fight against God's enemies. And he's going to subdue them. And so, because the Bible says that he will break the open sky and he'll come riding on a white horse. And on his vesture, it will be king of kings and lord of lords. And he has come to make war with the inhabitants of the earth. And he's going to put all things under his feet. So this is this is why we need to come under his protection, because he's uh, he's the one that will uh, that the that uh, the father had set up his kingdom, so that it was so that we could come into him, and so that this natural kingdom would be uh, would diminish, it would wax old, it would fade away in the natural because this has always been about a spiritual kingdom mm -hmm. it's always been about him being king and knowing for god's foreknowledge knowing that adam would sin and him being the son of god that for so he had to make a plan and he had to and he knew satan was going to get in and satan and i, I spoke last time that lust didn't come from the father lust was in the serpent remember in ezekiel it said that iniquity was found in the the uh, cherub the anointed cherub so that iniquity is the seedbed of lust mm -hmm. and it was found in the anointed cherub that uh that uh was that got into himself and perverted that which was supposed to be glorifying god he was supposed to be lighting up god's throne he was supposed to be worshiping at his throne. He, you know, redirected it and, and started focusing on himself. And when that, when he started focusing on himself, seeing his beauty, seeing his talents, that worship inside of him got perverted. Right. And it turned into this a seed of iniquity. Mm -hmm. This is the seed that got passed yeah. to us. And I wanted to read that because a lot of times, a lot of people talk about Eve 
was drawn out by lust. She, you know, she was, she was, uh, she, she had the, the pride, uh, you know, the lust of the eye because she saw the fruit and she saw that it was good. Mm -hmm. Well, you can think of something as being good or pleasant without having a desire, a lustful desire for it. I don't believe she had uh, any kind of lust in her. I, I, and I wrote this in my book, I believe her sin, her, her enticement was she was wanting uh, knowledge. He was, he was offering uh, esoteric knowledge yes. to her, and sh she was she was interested in in that. Not necessarily that she was interested in in in, in obtaining something with lust, which she thought that oh that was something that I want to covet and I want to have and I want to take for myself. No, she was he he dealt with her on a on a spiritual level. He dealt with her in a in an eschatic type of knowing something. He knew something that she did not know. Right. And that's the way it is with the occult world today. It's all secret. Mm -hmm. Secret knowledge, you know, it's this esoteric not only the adepts know this knowledge. You know, only the elites know the secret knowledge of their success and and it's all demonic and it's all and it's all Satan's plan to deceive them because they, you know, want to be, you know, be exclusive outside of just your normal uh, man and woman or, you know, they, they want to be, be seen as being, yeah, seen as being someone that is above your, just your average person on walk that walks the earth, you know. And they know something, and they have the secret to success. And basically, Satan is rewarding them for because he's giving it because they're doing his bidding here on earth. So he, there's a war, a rewards of iniquity that that conspire during you know with because this is they're gaining knowledge, they're gaining power, but they're gaining satanic knowledge and power. And it's going to lead them into dam damnation and destruction. Right. It's not. It's not benefiting them. It may be. It be benefiting them in the uh, in this this uh, natural world because they're you know they're very wealthy and they're famous and all that's all the things that we so covet as man because that's the seed that gets exploited. Mm -hmm. Pride in man gets exploited the pride of life and satan knows that because those are the things that are embedded in us that come from satan and it's this it's the selfish pride and i wanted to read that because since i mentioned it last time and uh it says uh, about lust this is it says it says, but every man, starting with James 1, 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, see, lust is a seed, and it bringeth forth sin. So it has to be conceived inside of you. It has to be cultivated inside of you. Once it's cultiv cultivated, then the sin will come forth. The product, the the product of lust is sin. Mm -hmm. That is what is being reproduced or re, uh, produced in your life. Once once lust gets a hold of you, once lust is you know is conceived inside of you, then you will execute on you what you want on that lust, because the flesh is going to get what f the flesh wants. Because when it comes to lust, lust. Is sensational. Lust uh, is it, 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 it's a driving force, and when if you're driven by lust, it's it's you can't you can't like just manhandle it. You it has to be because it's going to it's going to it's going to take its uh, full work in you. That's why we need the blood of Yeshua. That's why we need this seed in us expunge 
or destroyed and understand how lust can get exploited in our life and, and, and avoid those areas in our life that lust wants to take root in our lives, wants to develop and germinate in our lives, those things are have to be uprooted in our lives. The pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. These are these all are components of this iniquity, of this lust, the seed, and it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. And see, people that wants to know the secret knowledge or have this, uh, this uh, want to be elite, want to be Illuminati or what they want to be in this debt system, they want to be in these secret societies. See, they feel like they, they, are, uh, they, they do these things because it makes them feel with, uh, within themselves that they have self-worth uh, and it brings about pride in their life. And, and it gives them some sense of belonging and acceptance. Because we are nothing but orphans, like I've spoken before, because our father, the devil, makes all of us rejected orphans. And he puts people in our lives and he puts situations in our lives that, that really... Uh, to bring forth rejection, to bring forth uh, things like pride and 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 wanting acceptance, you know, pride is is a is a barrier. It's a, pride is a protector. It's a wall of protection. A lot of people build up pride because they've been reject their rejected souls. Mm -hmm. And you know, one thing that Satan likes to do, he likes to. Get us in working either in rejection or in rebellion. And pride is the wall for both. Mm -hmm. It is it is it, it's the root of it all is is selfish pride. That when you work in rejection or work in rebellion, usually pride is at the core of it. Because you want to be something in this life and you want to be accepted and you want to be acknowledged. And people, a lot of people, what they do is they'll go, they lose their former way of life, but then they'll come into religion and then they try to build the same kind of patterns in religion mm -hmm. to build up selfish pride, mm -hmm. which all stems from this seed of lust. That's why... You know, it's so easy for Satan to get us off course because we're always working in in this this iniquity that is embedded in us, this lust of and when and when lust is exploited and when and when we when we've been rejected, when when we're wanting to be to belong, when we're wanting to be acknowledged, when we want something we want to, to obtain then he's going to exploit those things in our lives and we will we, and we will we will execute to get to get those things most people will will uh, compromise their integrity to get those things in life and they will they will compromise the word of god and they will compromise their eternal life to to obtain and and to feel like they're somebody in this life and that's why that seed it will that seed of lust identifies us with the serpent. It, it is the same character that the serpent has. It's the same because what did he? He was lifted up in pride, mm -hmm. and what did he want to do? He wanted to exalt himself above God's throne. Yeah, he wanted to be lifted up. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be glorified. He wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to be acknowledged. He wanted to be accepted. He was already accepted, but he he want but he wanted all all that for himself. And so and so that iniquity within inside of him it just became in, enraged until he solicited a third of the angels to rebel against God. 
because he was going to dethrone or overthrow God's throne. He thought. He thought. <laughs> he's still he's still on that pursuit. Yeah. And so and so this iniquity is what's it's the seabed. Uh, you know, lust is the seabed for, for iniquity and sin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just like faith is the seabed for our eternal inheritance to be to be conformed to the image of Christ to to develop characteristics and attributes that are like the image of the father faith is the seabed lust is the seabed for sin so we have to remove the lust out of our life that seabed we've got to uproot it we got to plow it over we've got to and, you know, not water it, not feed it. We got to dry up those roots mm -hmm. that have been embedded in us through generations, through circumstances, through situations, through inheritance. And then we've got to lay a new uh, seabed of faith where we are, we're accepted in the beloved. We are adopted into the family of God. We can cry out, Abba, Father, because he has given us a spirit of adoption. So, so we're, we're, we are, we're changing sides. Do you see what I mean? Uh -huh. But the only way we can change, change over to this uh, kingdom of heaven under the Father of Spirits, and becoming a son of God is through faith mm -hmm. and laying a good seabed of faith and implanting his word of truth in that seed of bed of faith and let and coming under submission to Yeshua as our as the everlasting father to this race that is bringing in uh, the adopted heirs of God the adopted sons of God into this eternal realm, to the eternal throne. See, see the difference? Because the Father, you know, when they talk to, you know, the Father is prominently in the Old Testament, dealt with a natural kingdom. Do you see what I mean? He was dealing with a natural uh, circumstances and situation. But, you know, but within all this natural development, he had a plan. He knew that they were gonna fail. Yeah. At Mount Sinai, he knew before his foreknowledge, he knew that after 400 years that, you know, that he would have to come, he would have to make this promise to Abraham to come into fruition. But knowing that carnal men can't obey without the spirit being opened up to them and, and, and having this intimate walk, he knew that they were going to fail. It just... He, and then he, it, because of his foreknowledge, because of these are types of uh, shadows and pictures for us to see the holiness of God, God's separations and God's provision and his mercy and grace, we're starting to see his characteristics and attributes and his provision along the way. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, but he knew that he was dealing with them on a natural level, but it was a segregated because they couldn't come to draw near, but he was still dealing with them through Christ, even through Christ, because everything was through him. But, but, but in their mindset, you know, they, uh, you know, until this day, they still can't see this uh, triunity of the Godhead. You know, they they may see it. They have, there's some things in, in their religion that are, is more distorted now than it was before Yeshua walked the earth, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but they knew, understood Messiah. They understood that the, these things. They, they, they had more knowledge than what is, what is being portrayed today in the Jewish religion. But uh, they, but they understood that their Messiah was going to be eternal, and they still there's a lot of things that they do know, but they're not, they're not privily to tell us because it, it it doesn't behoove them to tell us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because if they tell us, then they, then we wouldn't be suckered in mm -hmm. to their to to really what's going to happen in the end days. So, so we, so we, you know, that they, they have an expectation mm -hmm. 
and so and they're and they're playing their role and that what their prophecies they feel like they're they believe and they do believe in a messiah that is going to bring an eternal uh the you know eternal realm mm -hmm. but uh, we can see that technology is their avenue mm -hmm. but anyways we're gonna and we're not gonna get off to two cores but I wanted to show, because uh, Yeshua, you know, is the progenitor. He is the father. So in in my book, The Last Kingdom, uh, I talk about this, about the bastard. You know, because now we become, we became a bastard status. And it's not that we're illegitimate. We, can't, we were born out of fornication. It's because we became hybrids. We became mongrels. We became a mixed breed. Our, 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 our uh, makeup, our, our physiology has been changed to, from where it was from the beginning. That's, that's what makes us not acceptable unto God. We've got to change that. But we can't change that in our physical realm. It only can be changed in the spirit, spirit realm. In the spirit realm, in the eternal parts of us. Mm -hmm. Can't our bodies will never change. They will perish, they will go back to dust. But in our in our soul and spirit, these were the transformations are going to take place because they are eternal. So God is making the difference. So being double minded to being spiritually minded where he's going to remove the duality from us where we're we're single minded. we're only eating off the tree of life we're not eating off the no, uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil which produces this sense of good and evil that's why people are having difficulty in the world to understanding what is right and what is wrong mm -hmm. what is light and what is darkness this is why they're twisted and that's why they're calling good evil and evil good because they're upside down and they're twisted in their mind because they have a duality in their soul and they're trying to reason you know reason things out in their humanistic mindsets and understanding that their mind has already been bent to to think like the serpent and not think like god so God is wanting us to get back to the tree of life where we're feeding and believing, which I've told many times before, the scripture to, to a Hebrew is a tree of life. The Torah scroll on the parchments the, the, are leaves. Mm -hmm. So the word of God is the, is the source with the spirit of God that is going to realign your mind to think like God. Think like him. Think in, think in his ways. Mm -hmm. Think in his, in his character and his attributes and in his nature. You're going to start thinking and, and behaving like him. Is that because he's conforming your mind to think like him in faith, in trust, in belief, in hope. Do you, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because we're putting our trust, hope, and faith in him and we're telling ourselves. This is the way it's going to be. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I have to tell. That's why David says, "Why are you kept? Why? Why are your soul so downcast? You, you soul, you know, you know, get up and praise God. Why are you so downcast?" He he told his soul what to do. Mm -hmm. He told him that you know he understood that his soul was downcast. He was depressed, and he had to command his soul to be uplifted. Yeah. That's what we have. And we have, there's many, many times I had to speak to myself and speak <laughs> myself out of the depression, speak myself out of the oppression, speak to myself out of the battle. I had to tell myself how to think, how to feel, mm -hmm. I had, and how I was going to behave when oh, things overwhelmed me, when uh, terrible news hit me. When I was broken inside, I had to tell myself how to handle the situation in accordance to God's will and according to his word. And my nature was torn up inside. I was, I was angry and wanted to vindicate. I wanted to lash out. I wanted to, you know, it wasn't fair to have these things happen to me. Do you see what I mean? You want to you strike out against, you know, 
the, the person that has hurt you the most. But then, and you, every time you're around, you just want to, you, you wanted to strike out at them or, or voice your, your feelings. Mm -hmm. But I come to realize that they don't care. People don't have that kind of, they don't have that kind of same sympathy for you. What you're going through may, may not be exactly how they perceive it. They may not be seeing that they're hurting you or doing harm to you or making you feel the way you're feeling. Mm -hmm. These are the feelings that are your struggles are within. And even if someone else is afflicting that struggle, they may not think that they're doing anything to you or, or causing harm and causing this oppression, causing this loneliness, causing this distrust. Do you see, they don't really feel it as much as you are getting the, what you're getting the full impact of it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mostly if you're dealing with people who are narcissistic, they have no, they have no guilt at all. They don't have a feeling about what they do. They, they just live for themselves. So, and, and you're in their way. So you're just going to be a victim to whatever they're doing. Do you see what I mean? So we have to learn to tell ourselves how to behave, to how to feel, and how to correct the things inside of us that get that get that get hurt, that gets uh, tore up, you know, that gets you know afflicted. Mm -hmm. We have to sometimes cover our own wounds and make you know. But the only way we can do that and put the healing balm of His Word and prayer. Sometimes it's the only way out. It's the only relief you'll ever get. Full recovery. Till that thing doesn't bother you no more. That person doesn't bother you no more. That situation doesn't bother you no more. Because you have healed through the process. And you use the right things. The scripture. You use the right remedy of scripture and prayer. And you covered yourself, and you spoke your the word over you. You spoke you your to yourself how you were going to behave. Then guess what? God can work through that, and you can see how God had He comes to bind the brokenhearted. He comes to put the healing salve on the wounds so that, that the enemy lashes at us. He is the only source of healing we have in this life. And he heals our soul to the uttermost. The Bible says he saves us from the uttermost. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, you know, <laughs> I mean, when you can really get a hold of that, he saves us to the uttermost. He saves us spirit, soul, and body. All the lashes, all the wounds, all the disappointments, all the anguish, all the suffering that you go through in this life, he, he comes with his, his healing balm and he starts to, to bind up those wounds and he starts to heal those wounds and he starts to cover those wounds till, till the wounds are, they, they don't exist anymore. You're, you're, not, you're, you're, you're not affected by the wound and you don't operate or behave any longer in an emotional womb that has been is festering inside of you you are free from that because he is the he's the one that still he is the god that healeth thee he is god that he is going to heal you from the uttermost your mind you will have peace in your body you will have stability and health and in your soul, you will be sanctified and made complete in him. Yes. That is, that is our goal. And, and so we are, we are laying the seabed of faith so that we can receive these healings, receive this, this, uh, this comfort, this peace, this joy, this shalom, this, this, uh, this, this joy, everything that God says we can have we can have because we believe and trust and we're preparing ourselves we're preparing our minds and our bodies to receive we're extracting the lust we're extracting the seed the seed of iniquity of self 
And we're putting our attentions and our focus on him, on God and God alone. And, and allowing, him to, allowing him to have full reign in our life. And let him be the, the arbitrator of our life. He's the one that decides. Mm -hmm. So anyways, but, but he, so he put all this provision in place through his son. This is all what the new covenant's about, is coming under him, coming into Christ. And let him be our master and let him be our Lord. He is the prince of peace, the everlasting, the mighty God. See, these are, these are he's, he, is, he is deity. He is the, the prince because Jacob was the prince of Israel. And the Bible says that the, there's going to be a, a, a false prince that comes. Mm-hmm. And tries to, you know, to tries to take over God's inheritance. So this position of prince is Mashiach, Messiah, the anointed one. Right. But he's also mighty God. Mm -hmm. And he is an everlasting father because he is our pregenerator of a born again, born in the spirit of a of his blood now we bear his blood in our body we bled, we bear the incorruptible seed in our body that makes him my father yeshua is my father if i have his blood inside of me and it's running through my veins then i have then he is my father my spiritual father and we are now being coming into the adoption to the, our Heavenly Father, the creator of all the universe. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Now we're, we're, now we're becoming back into this alignment that was, start, that was initiated in the beginning where we bear the image of God in our, in our, in our, in our, in our selves, in our, in our bodies, in our temples. So anyways, Yeshua introduced the Father to us because the days were coming when humanity would be reconciled to the Heavenly Father. The Father of creation, Yeshua came preaching the kingdom of heaven to bear the sons for the kingdom. So anyways, let me read this and then we're going to get into some of the adoptions, scriptures. So... Anyways, it says, anyways, it says in, it says, John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah, a.k.a. Holy Spirit, came to restore the hearts of the children to the father and the disobedience to the wisdom of the just and to prepare a people for the Lord. Satan objective objective is to destroy in mankind the image of God right. or the image of the father. The word father in Malachi means chief or ruler. The word bastard is an undisciplined, unchaste rebel who will not submit to proper authority. Deuteronomy 23 and 3, a bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord even to the tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Hebrews 12, 5 and 9. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaks unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he chases and scourges every son he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as a son and not a bastard. Uh, as a son, for the, what a son he is whom the father chasten. But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore are we partakers? Then ye are bastards and not sons. For furthermore, we have fathers of the flesh which correct us, and we give reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? So God chastens us, he chastises us is because he's removing the image that that iniquity that is embedded inside of us, the that is developing the image of the serpent or Satan, that pride of life, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and, and this covetousness. You know, and and self-exaltation. These these are the things that 
that uh, are are like the devil. Those, you know, these are the things that Satan's characteristics are. He's a self -love loving entity. He loves himself, and if he can get you into a self loving mode, narcissistic, and thinking of self and pleasing self, and and and, and desiring to do as self wills then you are nothing more than uh, uh you're nothing more than uh developing the image of satan inside of you right. see humanity kind of lays in the balance we can either go one way or the other we can we you know we're, we have this nature of satan in us that is embedded in our flesh but we don't have to deviate to the extent like some people do i mean they go way beyond your, you know, that you can possibly imagine, you know, like Aleister Crowley and some of these occultists, the things that they do, the debased things that they do, the, you know, and, and how they, uh, and they get pleasure in doing some of the most detestable things on the earth. We don't have to go that far, thank God. Morally, we can say no. There's good people morally that will say no i'm not going to do this but it doesn't make them say you will we, you know because you still have this iniquity that resides inside of you that is what has got to be dealt with before you can be welcomed as a son of god into the kingdom of heaven does that make sense yeah the only way to do that is repentance it's the repentance and changing and recognizing. See, yeah. demonic forces attaches to those attributes, mm -hmm. to the lust of the flesh, the th things that we do in the flesh. You know, when when you talk about demonic forces, you're talking about you know the things that you know the spirit of lying or the spirit of jealousy or the spirit of gluttony or your spirit of fornication or the spirit of adultery you got so many spirits but they all are the works of the flesh so you got all this all all this so the demonic attaches to the works of the flesh mm -hmm. and, and 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 then he then what it does he the flesh gets uh where it is unmanageable that situation becomes unmanageable because now a spirit is driving it it's not just the hu human the human put themselves in a situation that they could got a demonic force that now attaches us to that work of the flesh and now that work of the flesh is now it's just out of control that's where you see people go into in so into many realms in their in in sin because now they're not the driving force Sometimes it is. Some people have pleasure in sin, and and they love their demons, and they love the, and the drive uh, and the uh, sensational uh, state that they're in, and they do nothing to get themselves out of it. But most people that have a conscience of sin feel guilty of their sin, feel feel remorse of their sin, and the, and this is what God is dealing with you on because now you feel conviction and you want to change those behaviors. You know that they're not right. You know that they're self-destructive. You know they're destroying you, putting you on a path of 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 destruction, even right. in this life. And you want to make changes. Right. That's 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 the key. So God is working with that conscience of sin. That we recognize that is, I mean, this isn't right. This, you know, what I'm doing is wrong. I, and I'm feeling the guilt of sin. I'm feeling the consequence of that sin. And I want it to be removed. This is what Yeshua came. He came to remove the conscious and the guilt of sin. So that we can be liberated and free from sin. So that we can, by his strength and by his power, expunge sin. So sin has no more dominion over us. Right. And we have to expel the driving force, which are the demonic forces that lay, that reside in the flesh, reside in the soul, that keeps sin, you know, keeps sin going, keeps alive. sin, yeah, it keeps sin alive. You're right. Yeah. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and once you get sick of that sin, you're going to get rid of that sin. 
And, you know, I, I, I was thinking about that uh, person that you did that deliverance on a few years, uh, a few years back, how she was a believer mm -hmm. and how she uh, would go and she would, um, she would go through periods where she would get delivered, but then she would, she was always coming back. And, the, you know, the Bible says that, uh, you know, that, you know, if you deliver someone, that the demons would come back seven times stronger. And you realized after a while that she was loving her demons. She was, she wanted you to expel the demons. Remember? She, she would she would come and she would um, they would the demons would they would manifest they even like you know try to threaten your life they they kind of do it everything where you you had to expel them right you because they were being they were being aggressive you know they would expel them and then she would be all free and then a few months later she would come back with seven more demons stronger than what they were and you you come to find out that she wanted that because those demons were making her uh making her uh not uh, it it what what some because the people don't understand the wisdom of demons it gave her a sense of strength gave her sense of character uh she was a singer it it, it gave her a personality that was able to influence her audience and so she was thriving on the demonic force that was being being embedded into her every time she was getting deliverance. Remember that? Until you finally come clear, I'm not delivering you no more. I'm, I'm, we're not doing this no more because you're, you're not staying free. And that's why most people, you know, most people uh, are going around casting out demons and they're, they're getting people free, but they're, but they're not giving them the tools to stay free. And so the, the, you know, the demons don't care if you expel them because if you don't give them the tools to, to stay free, that, that host, you know, it, they're going to come back to that host and they're going to bring, and they're going to bring more demons with them. Yeah. So they want all these people who are out, you know, casting out demons. See, it's giving them notoriety, it's giving them influence, it's, it is showing, you know, it's exploiting the situation but they're not training up these people they're not telling them that you know that they need to stay free because you're going to come out worse mm -hmm. than what you originated originally started with and some people like her was was benefiting her career was benefiting her uh, talent was benefiting on having these demons so she her being a christian and being she was a performer and she wasn't relying on the spirit of god she wasn't relying on the holy spirit for her for because she would she covet the limelight mm -hmm. she covet the 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 applause the acceptance she she covet that so much and, to, and for her to stay in that realm, she had to, she had to open herself to the demonic. And that's what a lot of these people in, the, in fame do. They, they have to be, you know, have an influx of demonic forces driving them because outside of them, they couldn't perform. Outside, there would be, they would have too much hindrances. Do you know what I mean? They they wouldn't have the they would be they wouldn't have the capability or or you know sometimes uh, uh, it, it, it they would have inhibitions you know uh, they would have hindrances that would stop them you know because the flesh is weak the flesh can't do a lot of things I can't even do this without the Holy Spirit helping me I mean I wait on the Holy Spirit to give me what I want to say I can't just by my flesh nature i this is foreign to me to be able to talk in front of a camera or teach this is i mean this is not something that i've done or have groomed myself to do i have not i have not, i've not prepared myself to be to be able to speak in front of people or speak or you know with an audience
That's not been my profession. It's not been uh, something that I've been trained to do. I'm, you know, I'm just a blue collar worker, you know, mother, grandmother, and someone who just, you know, just loves God and just, you know, just lives a normal life. Mm -hmm. So this is way outside of the scope that I would ever think that I would, would ever do. I, if you asked me a few years ago if I would be up here writing, if I would be writing books and talking to my phone and, and teaching and I would be like, no way, <laughs> this ain't, that's not who I am. You know, this, this is outside of me. So God kind of had to uh, prepare situations to get me into this situation to be able to do what I'm doing. And I'm not perfect at it. I'm still in the training process. But I wait on God. I wait on the Holy Spirit to do it for me and do it through me. I pray. I seek the, the leading of the Spirit. I seek His Word. I seek what He wants me to say. Does that make sense? I don't, I just, I can't just get up here and just start gabbing. I don't have the gift to gab. I don't really like to talk much. I mean, I don't really like to um, conversate very much. I'm a very, just very introverted person and kind of stay to myself. And I, I'm very private, you know? So this is really out outside of my element mm -hmm. and my, per, my natural human personality. And I'm always the one that sits in the back and let everybody else do everything for me. You know what I mean? I'm just the, I'm the one that uh, kind of girds people and supports people. I'm never the one on the, on the one that is, in the yeah, in the forefront or the one that's speaking. I'm the one that, you know, my dad was a preacher and I'm the one that, and my brother's a preacher, but I was, you know, I was always there to support them and help them not to be the one doing the preaching myself. Does that make sense? I, I, you know, I encourage, I'm one that encourages people to do what God wants them to do, not the one that is actually doing it. And now the, it's, it's a different position. But, you, but what my point is, without the Holy Spirit, without Him doing it, I can't do it. Just like those people that are in the limelight, that are getting this, this fame and notoriety, they're not doing it by natural means. They're doing it because they're allowing the enemy to have driving force in their lives. And, they're, and it's spiritual because we're spiritual beings and we are being moved by the this, this spirit realm. And we need to know what spirit we are of. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, and I thought about that. And I thought, you know, we need, we need to be careful. We need to use discernment. Mm -hmm. And we need to know when to be able to exercise, the, you know, in these giftings that God has given us. Not everybody uh, needs to be delivered. It, I mean, we want deliverance for people, but they're not prepared. Does that make sense? And they're not ready to handle it. But anyways, God is chasing us and getting us going through the fire to remove that, that iniquity, that sin nature from us. John the Baptist was to prepare the people for the Messiah and restore them back to the Heavenly Father. He did not operate in the temple or among the religious folks. He was a legitimate Cohen Haggadah of the day of, of that day, but he did not administer sacrifices at the temple as confirmed in the high priest after the order of Aaron. A, a long time before people have, had removed away from God the Father, they opposed the will of the Father and had become a bastard children to him. John came preaching repentance, living in the wilderness, away from the mainstream of things and declaring the kingdom of God is at hand. The spirit of Elijah confronts the illegal authorities that hold people into captivity in the spirit realm of their soul and restores the children back to the true patriarch. John the Baptist immediately recognized Yeshua as the son of God. He saw the image of the father when, he, when no one else was able to see it. A lot of what was due to his uh, oh a lot of that was due because of his separation from the world john had a mission and he did not deviate from the call 
He was forged by God in Elizabeth's room with the infilling of the Holy Spirit before birth. The scripture says that the God of this world blinds the minds of the people so they can't see the people in the uh, world are blind until the glorious light of the gospel shines upon them. 2 Corinthians 4 and 4. And whom the God of this world has blinded the mind of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Colossians 1.15. Who is the image? Yeshua is the image of the invisible God, <laughs> the firstborn of all creation. <laughs> The image of Yeshua is express. Uh, the image of Yeshua is the express image of the Father. He is not the Father, but he, it, but his image reflects the invisible God. Mm -hmm. Hebrews one and three. God, who has served a time and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto unto the fathers by the prophets, hath these last days spoken unto us by His Son whom he hath appointed heirs of all things, by whom, hallelujah, also he made the worlds, see, by whom he also, so Yeshua made the worlds, so there's more going on in the unseen, because it says world, mm -hmm. let me look at that again, worlds with plural, mm -hmm. So he was he was there with creation, and he's been there for, from 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 the beginning, and he's created more than just this world that we live and exist in. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word, his word, the whole universe is upheld by the word of God by Yeshua of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of majesty on high what is the image of the father that needs to be restored so that the earth will not be smote with utter destruction so yeshua came to restore the image of the father inside of us yeshua bears the image of the father and we and we redeemed believers should bear the image of yeshua yes this is the mission to be conformed to his image. Yes. We delay the destruction of, of this world when, when the image of the sun is manifested in the earth. The bees also has an image that is being formed on the earth. The image of the bees reflects what is, is, what is represents as the children also reflects the beast. In their image. So the children of disobedience reflect this image of the beast. The image of the beast reflects what is represented, what we have here in the earth. And his children also reflect this image. So say we can't see Satan, you know, the you know, the the beast that comes out of the out of the sea. But his children reflect his image because yes. they have a part of him. It resides in, in them. And so we don't, we're, we're removing that. So we should be expressing the image of, of Christ, Yeshua, as he is the express image of the Father. Right. Before, okay, says, so before we examine that, let's look at Deuteronomy 23 and 2, the law first mentioned. Is the first place you see bastard in scripture. Strong's concordance bastard means to alienate, alienate or mongrel or a crossbreed. You're, it means that you are not pure. You're not from, from your original design. You have been contaminated. You have been corrupt. You have, there, you have been breached. And now you are a do you have a duality in you, a duality in your soul. You gotta get rid of it. That you have to get rid of. The number ten, it means earth, and it means divine order, complete cycle, or measure, group, or judgment. The Hebrew letter yod, hand, works, work, uh, works, a uh, worship, deed, first power, and congregation. So these are the definitions. The word bastard in scripture shows two images. Hybrid. It's a hybrid image. 
So what, what are we dealing with today? Transhumanism. They want to bring in a more uh, hybrid duality where people are more than just one gender. They're more than just a human. They want to bring, they want to mix species. They want to make chimeras and hybrids. They want to splice you. They want to splice the DNA and mix the DNA and, and make chimeras and, and, and form creatures that were not created by God because they want to corrupt and destroy the creation of God and what God's original design. He, they want to further this, this, uh, you know, they want to further this rebellion. That's what they want to do. They want to, they want to, because we still have we a conscience. It's by our conscience that we know that God exists. Because God put it within all man to have a conscience. You know, that even a sinner, it says in Romans 1, by, by their conscience they know that there is a God. So that's how God is getting, gets us to evaluate, self-evaluate our, our status and gets us into a place where we seek to be healed and delivered and set free. Right. We understand we have a human problem that he can only fix. When we get to a place where he, we know that he can only fix us, then we're candidates for salvation. Mm -hmm. But if you never think you need to be fixed, then you'll never seek for salvation. You'll never seek for the designer of, of humanity to, to correct the breaches in your soul and correct the, the, the defilements of your soul. Right. You, have to, you have to see where you are first. And, and, and come to terms with it before there can be healing, before there can be correction. You got to diagnose. It was a diagnostic. Diagnose the problem first uh -huh. before you can fix the problem. That's yeah. what. That's just. Per, that's just plain logic. Uh -huh. So the word bastard in scripture shows us two images, hybrids: the mixing of light and dark, obedience and rebellion. Hot and cold, the image of a mongrel. So light and darkness, uh, you know, they're t it's uh, good and evil, male and female, obedient and rebellious. These are the natures, light and darkness. These are the nature that, is, that, that has been exploited inside of us. Mm -hmm. That brings this chaos and this confusion within our soul. The image is not allowed to come into the congregation until the 10th generation. So this duality of soul is not allowed to come into the congregation of the Lord. Now we're talking about, we're not talking about natural. We're not talking about a natural congregation. But even though they segregated bastards and people with defects and had problems, the main, the, the leopard... You know, they, this was to show a type of shadow. But God is saying, nothing that I just, nothing that I haven't designed, nothing that I haven't created is coming into my realm. That is what is speaking. I am segregating Satan's creation, his his and his influences and his and his instruments, his handiwork. He's rejecting. I only accept my handiwork. God is saying, I only accept my handy handiwork. I gave you a remedy. The remedy is Yeshua and his blood. You rightly apply that. You get fixed. You can come and abide with me forever. But if you cannot weed this out of your, of your soul and get yourself fixed, by the blood of Yeshua, then I cannot receive you into my eternal house. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just plain and simple. It's just straight language. It's just straightforward stuff here. Because God is not rejecting a, a, an illegitimate son. 
someone that had that he that that child had had nothing to do with the situation. He was a product of of fornication. He was a product of rape, or he was a product of incest, or he was a product of of some sin. That's not what God is. Uh, he's not punishing the child. You know, before because of the circumstances that because he was created in such a circumstance, he is rejecting this duality that is within every human being, not segregating certain classes of people. Right. Does that make sense? Because we're all bastard children, we're all bastard until we become in, into and conform to the image of Christ. Until we come into the sonship of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's a be it's a beautiful thing. So this is all these types and shadows showing God's segregation to Satan's influences and handiwork. Yeah. The image is not allowed to come into the congregation until the 10th generation. The mutation must completely cycle out to establish a divine order. Or it will cause judgment to the whole congregation. God chastens though he loved to remove the defiling image that obscures the image of his son forming in us. The process can require much scourging. The natural image we bear is the fallen Adam and the serpent in our carnality. The father scourges him to put that flesh to death so Yeshua can live through us. The image of the father is in Yeshua. Although others cannot see it, John the Baptist did. Matthew 3 and 21. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. John was called to restore the image of the Father as the ultimate authority who rules from the heavens as the Father of Spirit. John preached repentance, which means we submit to a complete obedience and reverence to God's power. God is not a father to mongrels or hybrids. The soul of man must not be a hybrid habitation where the double-minded houses the demonic. Mm -hmm. The double-minded soul houses the demonic. Mm -hmm. that, that's why it can, they cannot, that has to be expelled. Right. That would make us reflect the image of Satan and the beast. The patriarchs understood that the inheritance was a kingdom with a king that submitted to a divine order. John called that generation vipers and poisonous snakes, the pride of the serpent, which was uh, housed in their very soul, kept them from seeing the image of the Father in Yeshua. John, John 5, 46, for he... For had he believed Moses, you, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Everything that has been written from the beginning is all about Yeshua. Because this was the seabed to bring forth the Messiah. It had, to, it had to be written down. Those words are seed that were planted in the seabed that came in a spiritual and natural seabed that brought forth a spiritual reality. He is the fulfillment of the purpose of the mankind's existence. Yeshua was, is, and is to come. When you start to remove Yeshua's authority as chief ruler in the kingdom and now push it into the future, men will become a law unto themselves. If you can't see that Yeshua is your chief ruler now and you submit under him and it's something that has been pushed into the future, then we, we will never come into this alignment with the Father. We've got to come in perfect alignment with Him. So, but that is what a bastard is. I thought I would explain that a little bit more in detail. And I wanted to explain to them that in the, uh, for the intercourse, because I say that words are like intercourse. The words get into your soul. And, and I wanted to read that definition. It says, uh, it says, it, uh, it, of course, it says physically sexual contact between the individual that invoke, the, uh, invoke sexual intercourse. Uh, so that's one of, uh, definition of intercourse. And then the second definition is exchange, especially of thoughts or feeling. 
uh, feelings. It's communion. So we have this spiritual intercourse with this word. Do you see what I mean? We, and with our interaction with the spirit, we have this communion with God that is spiritual, that, that he feeds into our soul. His seeds, his words, that should reproduce out of our lives right. and bear fruit. So I wanted to you know, clarify that this, that is what spiritual intercourse is. So when a sexual intercourse is when a man implants his seed in a woman's womb and, he, uh, and they produce a, a child together. That's the fruit of, of their intercourse. That's, the, you know, that, that's what, that's the, that is the product of their love and their union. Well, we should also have this same product for our communion with, our, with the Holy Spirit that we're, re, we're producing the fruits of the Spirit because the Word of God and the Spirit of God is embedded in our soul. And so now we should be bearing and producing the fruit of that that is in this communion of love that we have with each other in this right. relationship. So I'm bearing the fruits of the Spirit out of, out of my relationship with the Ruach. And as he embeds his word and his seed in me. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's the same. It's natural. The natural and the spiritual go hand in hand. So in Romans 9, let's, let's go ahead and go there. And we'll... And it says, and I, this was very interesting. I said, it's, I'm going to start with the first verse, Roman 9. So it says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ruach that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could, I could wish that myself were a curse for Christ. Boy, he had anguish for his people. For my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He, you know, he had such deep love for them. Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoptions. And the glory and the covenants and giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Who are the fathers and, of, and who are the fathers and of whom are concerning the flesh. Christ came, who is over all. God bless forever. Amen. So they understood, Paul understood, that Israel was disconnected to a father. And they had the power of adoption. They held, it says right there, to whom pertaineth the adoption. They had the, the eternal covenant of Abraham that could reconcile them to this spirit of adoption. They could have connected to the father of spirit at the time of Mount Sinai because it was entrusted to them so because it because humanity got cut off at the beginning so the only way back to the father would be through adoption they were they were no longer his they were no longer his creation they had been breached humanity has been breached so but but they, he was going to make them a kingdom of priests. He was going to commune with them. He was going to consummate with them. He was going to impart in them. He had sanctified them. He had baptized them. He had sanctified them with his word. And now he was he was marrying them. He brought it. You know, he gave them a kentuba, and and he re rectified that kentuba with a a confirming meal and with the blood with the hyssop. And now the only thing that remained was the consummation. And that 40 day of testing was their time. This was the time to prove them to see if they would be sons of God. Because the adoption would have taken place. He would have made them sons, heirs to the promises. To the eternal promises. I'm not, because this is about Abraham's eternal covenant, not the natural law of Moses that had to deal with the natural kingdom of Israel. But they would have been, because heaven came down 
They walked on sapphire stones. It says heaven came down in Exodus 32, I believe. And they went up to heaven. So heaven and earth met. And they were going, God was going to consummate. And he was going to establish this adoption. So to, to understand what could have happened and what did happen in Messiah, Yeshua, that he did fulfill his obligation. He did, uh, he was tested in all manners as we were. He did prove himself to be a son. And now he, because they failed in their, in their uh, position as being sons of God, and they were not faithful, but disobey God by committing fornication, spiritual adultery with the golden calf, they have proved themselves not worthy to carry this uh, sonship title through adoption. But they had it in their at their disposal. They had it in their hands. Mm -hmm. That's why the eternal covenant had to be crashed. It had to be uh, eliminated. It had to be, you know, it had to be uh, in ground up to powder. It had it because because that had to be eliminated because that's where the adoptions. They, cause they, because everything that Christ did was offered to them. Mm -hmm. Everything was offered to them in that old, in that old covenant. They could have started, they could have started a new, the, a, an eternal race. Do you see what I mean? Because with the spirit, that's why we're becoming conformed through our consummation with the spirit. They could have done that, but knowing God's foreknowledge, knowing that they would not concede to this consummation because they said, because he said, come up. And they said, no, Moses, you go up. You, you go and whatever the Lord says we will do. They refuse this consummation. But Moses didn't. Moses' face shone the glory of the kabod of the Lord. And he was not under the law. He was under the Melchizedek heavenly order. He was already consummated. And guess what? He went right direct to the heavenly realm. He, didn't, he escaped Abraham's bosom. Because he, he became a son. He was able to receive the adoption, the covenant, and all the things that were offered to them at Mount Sinai, the service of God and the promised land inheritance. Because what did what did God do to Moses when he died? When he buried him, he took him up mm -hmm. and showed them the land. But was it the natural promised land? No, it wasn't. It was his heavenly home. It was his eternal home. God buried him and God took him. Mm -hmm. And he showed him because you were faithful, you obeyed, you were proved to be a son. You came up, even in the thick darkness, even in the midst of, of oppos opposition, even in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the demonic forces, you made your way up here to me because none of that was going to hold you back to get into my presence. And because you didn't hell back, but wanted to come and commune with me, guess what? You get to be endowed with power and with the heavenly eternal promises outside of your own brethren. And now you are a temple of the Holy Ghost. And now you have been fashioned for me to abide in. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says he was the meekest man that ever lived other than Yeshua. Because he carried the characteristics and the attributes, the nature, the essence, and the persona of God himself inside his very being. He was humbled. He did not have not one ounce of pride in him. He had all reason to be prideful. He had every reason to glory not only in Egypt, but also to glory in the magnific magnificent places and the, the things that God did through him. The, the, his, the, the, uh, he, was, he, oh, he saw the Red Sea open. There was so much that, that God worked through him 
He's seen the marvelous works mm -hmm. of God through him. That he had reason to boast. He had reason to be pride, to have pride. But he'd choose to stay humble. Mm -hmm. He'd choose to have the nature of God. He'd choose to, to, to not have one ounce of that enemy rise up inside of him. He, he had, he, he understood because he, because something was imparted in him. He reflected the glory of the Lord. He reflected his image. That set him apart from everybody else. When everybody else was murmuring and everybody else was wanting their needs, man, and everybody else was uh, desiring things of their flesh, he stayed humble mm -hmm. in the midst of it all. He got angry with them at the rock, and he striked the rock, and he disobeyed, but and he did make a mistake, but because the pressure of life gets to us sometimes, but it was never anything that kept him out of the eternal heaven. Mm -hmm. Maybe kept him out of the natural promised land, but it never took him out of the eternal heaven because we've seen him at, at Mount, uh, you know. We see him at, at the Mount Trans Transfiguration. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, he see he seeing uh, what the Bible says. Uh, the children of Israel know my uh, works, but Moses knows my ways. See, they 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 experienced God and they understood His works, but but Moses knew Him on a level that that he understood God in his character and in his attributes and he knew how to please god that's a that's a, that's a different realm yeah. of intimacy that we need to get a hold of right and in romans 8 and i'm going to end on this it says roman 8 it says Therefore, is there no more condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit? For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that at, for they that are after this flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is intimate against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. Because it's, it can, means that, yeah, you can do the statues the ordinances but this but you that the laws of god that he's talking about are relationship laws mm -hmm. you can't love god without having an intimate walk with him you can't truly truly have a, re, a love for him an obedient heart to do his will unless you love him and you have to you have to be intimate with a person before you can love them you can't love person that you don't even know and you're not going to be loyal to somebody that you don't even know. It's like me be getting married to somebody in a foreign country. Here I'm a I'm a bride to some man to that lives in a foreign country, but I don't know him. I don't know when he's going to be back. Don't know when he. You know this is kind of what their perceptions are. They don't know when he's going to be back. I'm using this as an analogy, uh, and I'm supposed to stay faithful. So when somebody else that lives like next door to me, that is kind to me, that does good to me, is attractive, a, a gentleman, takes me out to dinner, provides for me, and, and shows me attention, do you think I, I'm going to be conscious, aware that I'm already a bride to somebody in a foreign land that I don't know, haven't seen, have not even had any kind of contact with, not had any kind of experience with? All I know is his letter that he gives me, that he sends me, but there is 
but that's all I know, but I don't know him. I have never touched him. I've never felt him. I've never been intimate with him. I've never, I don't know him from the inside out. And, and I'm supposed to be loyal to this person. I'm only loyal by contract, by, 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 by a certificate. Because somebody married me to them. My parents married me to them. Do you see what I mean? But it wasn't my decision. It wasn't, or I thought the decision was, uh, you know, that he would be home and he never came home. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you put yourselves in these, in these restraints. You bind yourself to law. You're binding yourself, you're to ordinances, to a God that you don't even know. To a, to a God that's so far and so distant from you. And you're working and acting in, 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 in just in, in conduct. But, you, but something else comes along that is going to entice you. That is going to make you feel good. That's going to be pleasing to you. Going to be pleasing to the eye. Pleasing to the flesh. Pleasing to, to your ears. Pleasing to your, to your taste. Everything around you is accosted because this person that you are, are can tangibly hold, tangibly see, can tangibly feel mm -hmm. is going to overwhelm you. Then you're going to fall into adultery or, you know what I mean? Right. Exactly. This is exactly the scriptures. This is exactly why Israel could not be faithful. This is why Israel always fell into spiritual adultery. Because they could never have an intimate walk with him. They couldn't touch him. They couldn't feel him. They couldn't draw near to God. They couldn't have this, this, this love and this compassion this, and this faithfulness to him because they didn't know him. They didn't know how he felt. They didn't know how he, what he, what was inside of him. They couldn't experience him. They only experienced him from afar. They only experienced him from a distance. They only got to observe uh, Moses and Joshua going into the tent. Well, the kabod come down. They worshiped from afar. The Bible says. Uh -huh. they, they and they looked upon there uh, on them, but they could never come into the tent. They can never experience the presence. And so you, so because of the way all things had taken place, because they failed to come into this consummation of relationship, and then they disobeyed God because then what did Satan do? Well, I'm going to offer you something that is tangible something that is going to make you make you feel good it's going to you're going to have you know excitement it's going to heighten your your senses you're going to eat you know, eat drink and be merry for a night but it cost them the their relationship with god that put them under a tutor that god brought brought them under condemnation because of the golden calves. But Yeshua brings us into this intimate walk. That, and we have an experience. We can tangibly uh, behold him. We can feel him. We know his, we can sense him. We know he's real. He, 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 he gets inside of us. He knows us from the inside out. And we know him from the inside out. That makes the dynamic so much different. Mm -hmm. Because now... My experience with God far outweighs anything in this world. Right. I, I don't want to be unfaithful to God. No way. I don't want to ever lose that presence. No, me neither. I never want to, uh, to never feel him in my life. I, I, I mean, I hold that and cherish that more than anything in this world. Right. So I guard myself. Protect, put the fences around me because by God, I'm never going to step outside of his covering, out of sight of his presence. When you, when you feel him, when you feel his power inside of you, when you feel the presence of God and you feel this inner strength and, this, and the excitement and the exuberance of his presence, there's nothing in, in this world that is going to separate you from the love of Christ. Right. But if you never experience that, 
everything's going to separate you. Yep. So anyways, I'm going to get done here. So then they that are in, in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. So it so be that the spirit dwells in you. See, we we cherish that. We you know that's what we protect is that spirit inside of you. And, and if as and if any man be uh, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So it says, but if the spirit of him, <coughs> choked, uh, the spirit of life. I love you. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of the sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies, his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not of the flesh to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led of the Spirit, they are sons of God. Hallelujah. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but if you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if we be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For if I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, hallelujah, are not worthy to compare with the glory, the kabod, the presence of God, which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of, of the sons of God. So we are wait. This is all about the manifestation of the sons of God. That means that God manifesting his image inside of you. And that is more important than anything else in this life. Right. Is to be a manifest son of God. Right. And to come into the spirit that bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And it says, for we, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We're not under the slave of Satan, for ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we call Abba, Father. So he restores us back to the Heavenly Father. <laughs> and so I think that's, and it says, for the earnest expectation of the creatures, Oh, I think I'm going to end on that. But this is why we must come into the sonship. We must come under the spirit of adoption to be made sons of God. And on that, I'm in. And she was saying, amen.